So this is Canto 2, chapter 3, verse number 11. And this is entitled Pure Devotional Service, Continuation. Etavam meva yajatam Ihane sreya sodayaha Bhagavat Achalo Bhavo Yad Bhagavata Sangataha Etavam eva yad jatam Ihane sreya sodayaha Bhagavat Achalo Bhavo Yad Bhagavata Sangataha Etavan eva yad jatam Nisreya Nisreya sodaya aha Bhagavad achalo bhavo Yad Bhagavata sangataha
Etavan, all these different kinds of worshippers. Eva, certainly. Yajatam, while worshipping. Iha, in this life. Nisreyasa, the highest benediction. Udaya, development. Bhagavati, under the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Achala, unflinching. Bhava, spontaneous attraction. Yat, which. Bhagavata, the pure devotee of the Lord. Sangataha, association. <coughs> Translation, all the different kinds of worshippers of multi-demigods can attain the highest perfectional benefit, which is spontaneous attraction unflinchingly fixed upon the personality of Godhead, only by the association of the pure devotee of the Lord. Mm. So the purport is very long, so please listen up. <coughs> All living entities in different statuses of life within the material creation, beginning first from the first demigod, Brahma, down to the small ant, are conditioned under the law of material nature or the external energy of the Supreme Lord. The living entity in his pure state is conscious of the fact that he is part and parcel of the Lord. When he is thrown into the material world on account of his desire to lord it over material energy, he becomes conditioned by the three modes of material nature and thus struggles for existence for the highest benefit. This struggle for existence is something like following the will of the wisp under the spell of material enjoyment. All plans for material enjoyment, either by worship of demigods as described in the previous verses, of this chapter, or by modernized advancement of scientific knowledge without the help of God or a demigod or illusionary only, for decide all such plans for happiness, the conditioned living being within the compass of material creation can never solve the problems of life, namely birth, death, old age, and disease. The history of the universe is full of such plan makers. And many kings and emperors come and go, leaving a plan-making story only. By the prime problems of, but the prime problems of life remain unsolved despite all endeavors by such plan-makers. Actually, human life is meant for making a solution to the problems of life. One can never solve such problems by satisfying the different demigods, by different modes of worship, or so-called scientific advancement in knowledge, without the help of God or the demigods. Apart from the gross materialists who care very little either for God or for the demigods, the Vedas recommend worship of different demigods for different benefits. And so the demigods are neither false nor imaginary. The demigods are actual factual, as we are, but they are much more powerful due to their being engaged in the direct service of the Lord in managing different departments in the universal government. The Bhagavad Gita affirms this, and the different planets of the demigods are maintained there, including the one of the supreme demigod, Lord Brahma. The gross materialists do not believe in the existence of God or the demigods, nor do they believe that different planets are dominated by different demigods. They are creating a great commotion after reaching the closest celestial body, Chandra Loka or the moon, but even after much mechanical research, they have only very scanty information of this moon, and in spite of so much false advertising for selling land on the moon, the puffed-up scientists or gross materialists cannot live there and want to speak of reaching other planets which are unable they are which they are able to count. <clears throat> However, the followers of the Vedas have a different method for acquiring knowledge. They accept the statements of the Vedic literatures as authority in toto, complete, as we have already discussed in Canto One, and therefore they have full and reasonable knowledge of God and the demigods, 
and of the different residential planets situated within the compass of the material world and beyond the limit of the material sky. The most authentic, the most authentic Vedic literature accepted by great Indian acharyas such as Sankar, Ramanuja, Madhva, Vishnu Swami, Nirbarka, and Chaitanya, and studied by all personalities of the world is the Bhagavad Gita, in which the worship of the demigods and their respective residential planets are mentioned. The Bhagavad Gita confirms 9.25, Yanti Deva Vratam Devam Pratin Yanti Pratin Vrataha Bhutani Yanti Bhuteja Yanti Mam Yaji Topi Mam the worshippers of the demigods reach the respective planets of the demigods and the worship of the forefathers reach the planets of the forefathers. The gross materialists remain in different material planets, but the devotees of the Lord reach the kingdom of God. We, have, we also have information from the Bhagavad Gita that all the planets within the material world, including Brahmaloka, are but temporarily situated and after a fixed period, they are all annihilated. Therefore, the demigods and their followers are all united at the period of devastation, but one who reaches the kingdom of God gets a permanent share in eternal life. That is the verdict of the Vedic literatures. The worships of the demigods have one facility more than the unbelievers due to their being convinced of the Vedic version by which they can get information of the benefit of worshipping the Supreme Lord in the association of devotees of the Lord. The gross materialists, however, without faith in the Vedic version, remain eternally in darkness, driven by a false conviction on the basis of imperfect, imperfect experiential knowledge or so-called material science, which they can never reach into the realm of transcendental knowledge. Therefore, unless the gross materialists or the worship of the temporary demigods come in contact with the transcendentalists like the pure devotees of the Lord, their attempts are simply a waste of energy. Only by the grace of the divine personalities, the pure devotees of the Lord, can one achieve pure devotion, which is the highest perfection of human life. Only by a pure devotee of the Lord can show one the right way for progressive life. Otherwise, both the materialist way of life without any information of God or the demigods and the life engaged in worship of the demigods in pursuit of temporary material enjoyments are different phases of phantasmagoria. They are nicely explained in the Bhagavad Gita also, but the Bhagavad Gita can be understood in the association of pure devotees only and not by the interpretation Interpretations of politicians or dry philosophical speculators. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Menovistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadamayam Tadati Swam Padanti Kam Yama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesa Sunyavadi Pasyatya De Sitarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So this this verse and the previous verse sums up the, the, the previous ten verses which are describing how people can practice various types of worship to achieve material benefits by worshiping the, the specific types of demigods. And then, of course, we understand that that is only for those who can't worship the Supreme Lord or won't worship the Supreme Lord. So allow for allowing people to stay, what they say, within the house of Veda. In other words, under the care of the right 
what we say spiritual practice, they can move up to ultimately understanding that real worship is for the Supreme Lord. Uh, the Supreme Lord is the only worshipable object, and that's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna himself. Bahunam Gyanam Amante Gyanam Amam Prabhadyante Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Siddhulabhapa After many, many births and deaths, studying scriptures, worshipping the various types of living entities, demigods, performing all kinds of austerities and penances, one has to come to the point of understanding that without surrender to the Supreme Lord, then all their endeavors are simply, as they say, Shrama Ebihi Kevalam, useless waste of time. <laughs> and so, this verse pretty much sums up all types of worship and pretty much rejects it. But then again, it also says one in other interesting thing, that any success in any field of activity even in the material world, depends on the mercy of the Lord. <laughs> Although the conditioned souls sometimes neglect or even reject the fact that God exists, still they can't do anything without the sanction of the Lord. It's amazing, because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, if you want knowledge, I give it. If you want forgetfulness, I give it. If you want remembrance, I give it. If you want to rem forget me, and you want to make a philosophy around how to forget me, I can teach you that philosophy. <laughs> so although they are ruling out the existence of God, at the same time they're getting information from God on how to rule out the existence of God. Interesting. Because no one can get any knowledge anywhere unless the Lord sanctions it. And just like Lord Chaitanya was uh, after the Kazi had broken the drums and forbid the devotees for performing kirtan, Lord Chaitanya became quite angry. He came to the house of Sri Bhas Thakur and he started to speak. Because Sri Bhas was very nervous about what had happened and he started to worship his deity of Lord Nishringadev. And then the Lord came and broke down the door practically <laughs> and says, that person you're worshiping I'm, is here right now. <laughs> so he came in, the Lord, in a very heavy way, forceful way. And he, he basically said, what can that Kazi do? If I don't allow him to do anything, he can't do anything. But even if he works independent of my will, still, you know, I will defeat him. So the materialists, they depend on, they think they're depending on their abilities or the knowledge they accumulated, or maybe the resources they have. But ultimately, even with all these things in place, just like in the, the example is given, uh, it's called the wedding party. The famous verse, famous story of the wedding party. It was a big wedding party, and so they had to cross the uh, the river to get to meet to go to the other side where the wedding ceremony was going to be held. So they all got into the boat late at night and decided to row overnight and reach there in the next morning. So the Everybody was there. They had the rowers. They had everything. The boat was in good shape. All the plans were made. And the rowers started to rowing. And after everyone woke up the next morning, expecting to be on the other side, they all looked around and found out they were in the same place. <laughs> they didn't go anywhere. What happened? They forgot to pull up the anchor. <laughs> and therefore, and although the rowers were rowing, and everybody's hopes were to get to the other side. Nothing happened. So in the same way, people can make motions to do things. But unless the Lord sanctions it, nothing happens. But the Lord will sanction even the materialists to fulfill their material desires. 
just so he allows them their independence. But at the same time, he's always encouraging through the process of, uh, what they say, destroying their success in life through various ways, so they will eventually come to the pro platform of worshiping the Lord. And here it mentions something interesting at the end. Prabhupada sums it up that even worship of the Lord is incomplete, or what we say, unsuccessful, unless worship one, one worships the Lord's pure devotee. He says, only by the grace of the pure devotee then can the highest perfection of life be attained. No one else can become successful in devotional service unless they worship the Lord's pure devotee as the representative of the Lord, not as the Lord himself. <laughs> Sometimes people like to misrepresent the representative as being the as being God. Now that is very common in many places where the rep especially in certain philosophical areas where they say that the guru is also God and uh, therefore we accept the guru and when we reach perfection we also become God and therefore we don't need a guru anymore because the guru is like a ladder he helps you get to the top of where you want to go and then you don't need the ladder anymore so you throw it away. So, but at the same time, they don't understand, they think that by worshipping the Guru, they can also become the Guru and therefore they become God. So Prabhupada said, there's only one thing worse than underestimating the spiritual master, that is overestimating the spiritual master. Interesting. To underestimate is always natural because we can't really understand the glories of Krishna's pure devotee. And so uh, underestimation is something that is quite common. But to overestimate, to say that the guru is God and I can also become God by becoming a guru, then that is one of the greatest offenses. But then there's another class of people who don't s think, well, I can worship God directly. I don't need a guru. We find that and even in our society. We find devotees have been around our society for many years, 10 years, 20 years. I know one person, 30, 35 years, does service every once in a while, comes to the temple, even goes out on books, distributes books, but don't talk to him about accepting a spiritual master. He'll immediately, you know, go away. Doesn't want to hear it. And some people get all excited about accepting a spiritual master, but they never do. <laughs> but the Shastras say, Tad Vigyartam Eva Guru Abhigachchet. Abhigachchet means must. It's not a small word. It means one, in order to achieve the goal of life, which is pure devotional service to the Lord, one must take shelter of Krishna's pure representative and work according to his direction. Only then can one be successful in the execution of their spiritual activities. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they may get a little freedom from material suffering, but they will never get devotion, pure devotion to Krishna. Okay, so these are some of the points. So all these are so pretty much summed up. Prabhupada goes through various things. Ultimately, one should reject all kinds of other worships. There's that verse, what is that verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Um, uh, Tad Brahma, what is that? Uh, from? Hmm. 2.16 in Bhagavad Gita. 2.15 and 2.16, no, I'm sorry, not 2. 8.15 and 8.16. Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Purna Vritya Arjuna Mamu Petu Punar Janma I can't remember the last line. Uh, Navidyate. From the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, all are places of birth and death wherein repeated birth and death take place. Therefore, one should not try to make any you know, permanent solution in this material world because whatever you establish is destroyed by time. 
And even if you get some success in material life, the more successful in material life you are, the worse it is because you give, become attached to that success. And what happens when you lose it, it's painful. It's like, you know, if you've never been rich, then you don't really miss money so much. But then again, if you've been rich and then you became poor, that really hurts. <laughs> so in the same way that people have a lot in this material world and some success in life, they suffer the most when they lose it because their attachments are so strong. But any attachment, whether it's small or what we say large, will cause one unhappiness when one loses it, which is inevitable. So therefore, one don't waste time in trying to make a nice material arrangement here because it just keeps changing anyway. You make one arrangement, time takes that away, you make another arrangement. That's lost in time. But ev whatever we do in devotional service is never lost by time. It remains. Just like if even if you don't become fully devoted in love of God at the time of death, if you have m made 50% advancement in Krishna consciousness, and then suchinam simatam gehe yoga brasta prajayate, then you start we're 50% in your next life. In other words, you don't lose anything by changing life. Or even if you stop your devotional service in this life, and then you pick it up again later in life, wherever you stop, you start. It's never lost. But any kind of activity, either karma yoga, jnana yoga, or any kind of yoga other than bhakti, or material activities, uh, if you don't complete them, you don't get the result, and you lose everything. That's how that's how everything works. So therefore, there's no loss, even if you fall short. Today is the disappearance day of a one great devotee in our movement, Jayananda Prabhu. It's always celebrated the day before uh, Lord Nishringadev's appearance. And it's actually marked on the calendar of the Vaishnav calendar. It's the only devotee in the in ISKCON ever that had been given recognition to have a, his disappearance day honored by the whole society. And Jayananda was interesting. He joined in 1967 in San Francisco. He was a, a cab driver. He came in contact with the devotees in the early days and started coming to the San Francisco temple. When Prabhupada wanted to publish his Bhagavad Gita, Jayananda mm, was giving every bit of his money for that publication. He gave $5,000 to the publication of Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. Now, $5,000 today and $5,000 in those days is quite different, <laughs> very different. It's about 10 times different. The money has devaluated very rap rapidly over the time. And so $5,000 now is close to $50,000. Then is it close to $50,000 today? And so he worked hard, and when Prabh he knew Prabhupada wanted the money, he was still driving his cab so he could make the money, and he was giving everything, not even a penny for himself. And he would come to the temple simply to take prasadam and rest there. <clears throat> but then he would go out and drive his cab all day. He gave everything to Prabhupada. Jayananda was known for so many amazing qualities. One of the qualities is that he worked really, really hard. <laughs> I mean really hard. He was the last one to take rest at night and the first one to wake up in the morning. 
No one ever saw him sleeping because he was always the last one to rest. No one saw him getting up in the morning because he was up before everybody else. When he would sit and chant his rounds, he'd sit in one place, close his eyes, and be a com completely absorbed and chant 16 rounds. His intention and his absorption in chanting the holy name was so amazing that it was like, you know, for whatever time it took him, two hours, whatever, and he didn't say anything, do anything. He simply absorbed himself in chanting 16 rounds. And then, after his rounds, he would go out and take do services. He worked so hard. <laughs> um, and he was always doing something. He became famous for establishing the first Rathiatra cart in Is Iskand. He designed the cart, and he built the cart himself. He built it in such a way that the cart was able to go through the streets of a, the big American cities and somehow or other go underneath all the telephone lines that were hanging low because he built it with a crank that could bring the, uh, the canopy up and the canopy down. And uh, he would build the cart himself. Sometimes there was devotees were in a hurry to get the cart built, so he would work all night through the night. And sometimes when he would be working, people would be walking on the streets, because in those days he, he would work right on the streets. And he would see two guys walking along or somebody and say, come on, you want to do some service for God? Come on. And they would say, oh, all right, come on. What are we going to do here? So they would come and help him build the cart and he would show him how to do things. In 1976, Prabhupada, Prabhupada's last major Rathayantra in, um, in America, Prabhupada had had Rathayantra in all the big cities, in many big cities of America, but not New York. And Prabhupada was thinking, New York is the most important city in the world. It's also the most important city in the U.S. I want to bring Lord Jagannath down the streets of New York City. So the devotees really worked hard, and with the help of Jayananda's others, they got permission for the Rathiyatra. And not only did they get permission, they got permission for the most important street in New York City, Fifth Avenue which goes for miles and miles and miles, that one road. So the devotees were really happy. Prabhupada was really excited. Now I'm going to bring Jagannath down. Jai Sisi Gaudanitai Ki Jai. I'm going to bring Jagannath down the streets of New York City. And so... The devotees were working to build the carts. I can, it's in, interesting too, I should give you a little side thing here. Our present president of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, we couldn't find any land to build the carts because New York City is a metropolis and everything is private property, everything is commercial or industrial. Devotees were going everywhere. Where can we build these carts? Couldn't build them on the streets. Finally, they approached Donald Trump, and Donald Trump gave his land, and the devotees set up that. And so, Mr. Trump did a nice service to Srila Prabhupada in 1976, where he offered his property, so we could, which was a huge parking lot, that we could use for uh, setting up or building the Rathiatra carts. So it was, Prabhupada really wanted to do it grand, so they built three gigantic carts, huge carts, full-size carts, really big. Now, this was going on, and just before the Rathi Archer, the day before, they were finishing up the Rathi Archer cart. Finally, just in the evening, at 6 o'clock in the evening, 
The carts were finished before the next day's 10 o'clock Rathiantra beginning. But this parking lot was located right near the Hudson River, which is a big river. And so sometimes there would be a lot of wind coming off the river. So around the same time they had finished, all of a sudden a huge wind came and, not, and blew Balaram's cart so hard that the cart fell over and smashed to the ground. And, and the cart was broken in many places. The, the devotees were thinking, what are we going to do now? No cart for Lord Balaram. So the devotees had different ideas. We'll just have two cards. No, that wasn't satisfactory. No, we have to have three cards because we have three big deities. So Jayananda, this is a beautiful story. When I was in London, I went to one class given by one American devotee who had just come from come to, to London. And he gave the whole class on what happened after that card smashed. It was amazing because the pieces of the cart were broken and they were irreplaceable. They didn't have any of those same pieces anymore. And so Jayananda wasn't discouraged. He just rallied all the devotees. <coughs> and somehow, it's a long story what happened. They worked in that the whole night from se seven o'clock in the evening all the way through the next, all the way through the night into the next morning. And by the time, just before the time for the Rathiatra cart, first session, Balaram's cart was finished. And it was amazing because some of the steel that they needed for the cart was no longer available. But someone remembered that they had some extra steel that they had put on the side and left it there for discarding. And somehow or other, they were going to throw it away, but they didn't. And Jayananda remembered that. And then when he remembered it, they brought it and they built that cart. And of course, Prabhupada was so happy. Prabhupada practically danced the whole time during that 1776 Rathi Yatra cart. My mother, she went to that Rathi Yatra. It was the only Rathi Yatra she ever went in her life. <laughs> And later on she told me, she said, oh, that was so nice. I really liked that parade. <laughs> she was really, like, really amazed to see. And Prabhupada felt like he had conquered the world. Now I have brought Lord Jagannath down the streets of New York City, the most biggest city in the world, most popular, down the main street of Prabhupada conquered the world. And Jayananda, Jayananda saved the day by doing that. Jayananda had so many amazing qualities. One of the qualities is he would never criticize devotees or never listen to anyone else criticize devotees. If someone was talking bad about a devotee and Jayananda was there, he would immediately turn around and leave. And then the devotees would get the understanding, oh, we're criticizing and Jayananda's teaching us. And so he would immediately laugh. He didn't read the books so much, but he was living the books. This was the most amazing thing. He's, when people would ask him, are you reading the books? He said, well, I really don't have time because I have so much service to do. And sometimes when Prabhupada would come to the temple where Jayananda was, Jayananda wasn't around. And Prabhupada would have his darshan. And then he would say, where's Jayananda? And when uh, <coughs> the devotees would say, well, we have to go find him. He's doing some service somewhere. So they would look all around and find him doing some service somewhere. The devotees didn't have hardly any money in those days. So sometimes grocery stores, big grocery stores, they would take produce that was still pretty good but it was just like it wasn't completely fresh so they would throw it in their their dumpsters 
these big gigantic green um, things for garbage. Jayananda will go inside, find the vegetables, clean them off, and then he would make the, and then he would send it to the kitchen and they prepare it. And because the devotees couldn't, in those days we didn't have any money. Everything was tough. <laughs> I mean, really tough. We could tell you stories about that. We didn't even have proper clothes in those days. And uh, so what Prabhupada would call, where's Jayananda? Bring him. And so they would bring him and they would say, Prabhupada wants to see you. And then he would come, offer his obeisances. Prabhupada would smile, and speak to him like a friend. And then he would say to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I have some service to do. Can I go? Prabhupada said, of course. Yeah. <laughs> he was so absorbed in service that he, and Prabhupada, and he, uh, Prabhupada knew he understood the meaning of Krishna consciousness. And when he would give a class, all he would talk about is how wonderful Prabhupada was, how wonderful Krishna was, and how wonderful chanting of the holy name was. <laughs> that was his whole class. I have an actually a re tape recording of his class he, that he gave. It's really sweet. He just talks about how wonderful Prabhupada is. <laughs> he doesn't get into a lot of philosophy, you know, he just, but he's actually living the philosophy. Um, he would go to the shopkeepers and sometimes he would beg if they had any extra vegetables or any produce or anything, fruit or whatever. And sometimes they would give it to him. And sometimes they would, you know, sell it to him at a cheap price. He made friends with all the, all the fruit stands and the vegetable sellers like that. When Jayananda left his body, even those people were crying. They weren't even devotees. That's how much Jayananda touched the heart of everybody. He was so humble, but yet so enthusiastic to serve and to, and to please Srila Prabhupada. He got leukemia, which was something that he, you know, he was just working so hard, he never took care of his body at all. He was just working, working, working. Finally, he got leukemia, and at one point he had to go to the hospital. When Jayananda loved Prashadam, oh, he really liked Prashad. I mean, really loved Prashad. <laughs> and he would eat pretty much good quantities of Prashadam. So when he was in the hospital, they were giving him hospital food. And the devotees that were visiting him, he would say, you know, bring me some maha, please, because I can't eat this other stuff here. <laughs> so they would sneak it in because the hospitals wouldn't allow food coming in from the outside. So the devotees would sneak it in and give it to Jayananda. <laughs> he would eat prashadam. It's interesting because in 19... 77, May 1st, 1977, Jayananda was in Philadelphia in America. And he was very sick. He was back at the temple and he was staying in one room. And just at the beginning of Mangalarti on that day, Jayananda left his body. Just as the sound of the conch shell blew, to greet the Lord in the Mongol Arti, he, he disappeared. Prabhupada wrote a letter directly to Jayananda. He addressed him in the, in the letter. My dear Jayananda, I am feeling great separation from you. This is Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada was so, what we say, uh, glorifying Jayananda, that it was amazing. We never heard Prabhupada glorify his devotees like this. And in that letter, he writes that, Jayananda, your life is successful. 
and you'll probably go back home back to Godhead. But if you ha but if you had any material desire, then you'll take birth in the heavenly planets with the demigods and live there for many millions of years, and then you'll be transported to the spiritual world. But I am sure, Prabhupada writes at the end of the letter, you went back home, back to Godhead. Prabhupada wrote that about Jayananda. It's amazing, I have one disciple. It's frankly the first disciple I ever made in America. She was a, a hospice worker. She takes care of people who are leaving their body. They're, they, they have these hospices for people who are about to leave. And so one day, she had this lady, patient, who was on the verge of leaving her body. Uh, because she was a devotee, this lady said, Oh, my, my son was a devotee in the Krishna Conscious Movement. And he, he died many years ago. And she said, Well, who was, what was your son's name? His name was Jayananda. Interesting. So my disciple became, she said, really? You're the mandir or other of Jayananda? The Jayananda? The famous Jayananda? The one that Prabhupada loves and showed so much attention and affection for? And she didn't know how important her son was in the movement. She knew he was just a devotee in the movement. So then she learned about that. And then, of course, the Jayananda, one of, Jayananda had a sister and she married. So the sister and the husband came also and then met, met this devotee. And they were so happy that their mother was being taken care of by a devotee who was a devotee in Iskand. And then, of course, it's interesting how Krishna arranged that. That's the interesting part. Here's the mother of a very famous devotee. She's leaving the body. She knows nothing too much. She doesn't know much about devotional service. She's in an ordinary hospice, and she gets taken care of by a devotee in her last days. And, of course, that devotee was giving her Krishna consciousness as she was leaving also. So this is amazing how Krishna works, and just to show that, that even the mother of this great devotee was not forgotten by Krishna. Krishna arranged for her. Uh, that's a nice story. And then I asked my disciple, her name is Kalindi, I asked her, can you write, you write about what happened? And she wrote me this two or three page letter describing everything. So this is a little bit about Jayananda. There's much more to his life. There's one book written by one devotee, uh, a disciple of Prabhupada called Ashok. His name is Ashok, and he wrote The Life of Jayananda. And that book is available in ISKCON circles. I don't know, maybe it's out of print now, but it was available for many years. And then there's another book that wasn't so much circulated by a good lady named Denista, She's also Prabhupada's disciple. And she wrote a book on the life of Jayananda. I have the manuscript for that, but I don't have the actual book because I'm not sure what happened to the book. So, But anyway, if you want to learn more, and then of course if you go online, you can just type in Jayananda and you'll find a lot about his pastime. So today, and Prabhupada said, in every Rathiyatra, we must put the picture of Jayananda in the front part of the Rathiyatra. So devotees do that. So his picture's there leading the Rathiyatra. In every Rathiyatra, all around the world, wherever it's an Iskand Rathiyatra. Mm -hmm. well, it's a very special personality who gave his life to serve Srila Prabhupada's mission. He literally gave his life. And Prabhupada gave him so much attention and also mercy. Okay, so we can stop here. We do have maybe some time for questions. There, yeah, yes, uh, Devarshi? 
Well, I understand you. It was Ratheatra in uh, New York, uh, 1976. 76. Yeah. But Prabhupada left this planet 77. 77, yeah. This means the same year Jayananda also left. Yeah, Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada, Jayananda left May 1st, 1977, which was just a few months before Prabhupada. About six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The whole story of that building of the rebuilding of the Rathkar, mm, I have it. Mm. Um, on, I think it's I have it in documentations when, because there were many news articles that came out describing that. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? Anything back there, uh, Mark and Dea? <laughs> okay, I guess that means they're happy, <laughs> satisfied. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Jayananda Prabhu ki jai. <laughs>